In today's lecture, we'll be talking uh, about uh, a quite large topic, which will be called sensor fusion. So uh, we will be uh, discussing this topic for the next uh, four lectures. And um, you will see that it's a quite large topic. Uh, we will see many algorithms that are used uh, to fuse uh, the signals that you get from different sensors. So uh, starting from today, we will focus uh, on the algorithm part. Um, we will talk about algorithms that are used to process the signals from sensors. So uh, what does it actually mean if I say sensor fusion? A sensor fusion is uh, a concept that uh, we use uh, all of us uh, without calling it that way. And uh, it basically means that uh, we fuse signals that we get from different sources. So, for example, we see some optical signal with our eyes. We see uh, that uh, we have object around us. We are able to uh, get uh, an idea how far they are. We are able to hear some sounds, so we can localize sound. We can get directions, for example. Uh, we have taste, so we can uh, get some, let's say, chemical information about uh, our environment. Uh, we have, of course, touch, so we can touch an object. We can get, uh, for example, a feeling, what is the temperature of the object, uh, how wet is it, and so on. And then, of course, we have smell. So, uh, using our senses, uh, we are able to map our environment, and uh, we can create what we could call a model of the world. So in our brain, we have uh, an idea what is happening around us. And in terms of sensors, this is uh, exactly uh, what uh, will be quite useful for uh, many engineering systems. So uh, we have some system, we have some machine, we have some airplane, we have uh, some control system, for example. And uh, this gets some data from the sensors. Internally, it will use this data to get some knowledge about the environment. It will measure the temperature, it will measure humidity, it will measure position, and so on and so on. And based on this knowledge, it will be able to create an internal model. Of course, the model here is shown as in quote marks because it does not have to be like a, a real mathematical model. It can be only our simple idea how we can actually control the system. So uh, most of you already had some uh, classes about automatic control. So this model uh, might be something like um, a very simple one equation that uh, describes our system. And the controller may use something like P-type control, for example. So uh, don't take this world, the, the model, as uh, an exact representation of uh, what we have around us. It is only some means how we can imagine what's happening around us. Of course, this may mean that uh, we can have also quite a sophisticated model. For example, if you would be predicting weather, you would measure temperatures, you would measure humidities, you would measure wind speed, you would measure the cloud position, and so on and so on. So this model might be also very, very complex. And we will use this approach to improve our knowledge about the environment. And uh, by this, I mean also not only like environment in terms of temperature or humidity, but uh, basically about any technical process. And uh, this sensor fusion algorithm can help us to uh, get uh, more info about the environment. So we will not use the signals from our sensors independently, but uh, the algorithms that we will learn will 
in some form join this knowledge and uh, will give us uh, a better understanding of what is happening. Now, the typical term that I will use is sensor fusion, but uh, in literature you may find it also under different names. It may be called data fusion, information fusion, multi-sensor data fusion, and so on. So there are many names of uh, the concepts that we will see uh, in those lectures. Uh, the algorithms that you will see is uh, they are used um, in uh, many areas. So it's not uh, related just to sensors, but you may find them in economy, you may find them in uh, signal processing and so on. So the algorithms that I will show you uh, can be used uh, in, uh, in many areas, not only in uh, the field of sensors. So in my lectures, I will focus uh, on uh, the sensor field but uh, you will see that uh, the algorithms are universal. So uh, you may use them in image recognition, you may use them in um, basically any area that, uh, that you may encounter. So what does it mean when uh, I will be talking about sensor fusion? So uh, I will be talking about uh, algorithms or methods that uh, are used to combine two or more signals. And uh, the goal will be to get better information. And now what does it mean better? Uh, it means that uh, we take the original signals from our sensors. For example, if you have a system like this, this might be temperature, this might be humidity, this might be pressure, this might be anything else that you can imagine. We add to the data that we have from the sensor, the raw data, we add uh, somehow what we know about the system and then we use this combined or improved signal to control our plant. So this what we know that might be various things. That might be a mathematical model. That might be our expectations about what should happen in the system. So this word better can mean many, many things. It can mean, for example, that our final signal that we use in the control system will have lower noise. So we take uh, two or more signals from, let's say, the same variable. Let's say we measure temperature with three independent sensors and this allows us to get lower noise. It may also mean that we can get higher accuracy or resolution. So again we combine the two or more signals together and we get uh, an improved signal that we then use for con a control system. It may also mean that we have a higher reliability or higher robustness. Um, for example, let's say we, you have um, an airplane and uh, you need to measure the, let's say, airspeed of uh, the airplane. And of course, this is a, a critical system where if your sensor fails, then you lose completely the information. And uh, the robustness or reliability here may mean that uh, you need to use two or three or four or more of the sensors for the same variable. So that when one sensor fails, you have uh, a redundancy and uh, this will give you better robustness of your method. So we, one sensor fails, but you still have two more that are working properly. And uh, one of the methods that I will show you today uh, will be talking about how to make uh, this decision if uh, our sensor is reliable or not and how to get a warning that uh, you have an error in, in a signal from a sensor. Uh, better can also mean that uh, you can check the consistency of your data. So, for example, let's say you are tracking uh, the 
movement of, uh, of a boat and suddenly the boat disappears from from your sensor so it's a radar and you you're seeing the boat or an airplane and suddenly you measure that the, the plane or the, the boat is not there so it may mean that um, you have a wrong reading from your sensor because physically the the boat or the, the plane cannot move and cannot disappear suddenly uh, of course un unless there is there is some 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 problem it falls down or sinks or whatever but uh, in terms of like a physical model it's not possible that uh, the object moves so fast so uh, you can check the consistency of your data and you can issue a warning saying attention there's something wrong with my signal something wrong with my sensor data and uh, you can send this signal to an operator as a warning for example a better signal can for example mean that uh, you have uh, higher noise immunity in industrial areas it's uh, quite common to have a lot of uh, electromagnetic interference so uh, your signal needs to be immune against uh, EMC so it needs to be compliant with uh, other electromagnetic fields that are around you so if we use more sensors of the same variable we can also reduce this uh, problem of noise and uh, we can get a better signal better info from our system and this is not related only to EMC but it can be related also to physical phenomena for example, let's say you have uh, a LiDAR and this LiDAR measures uh, the environment around you. It is uh, quite often used in, let's say, autonomous units like uh, robots or today autonomous cars. And uh, since this is an optical system, it may have an issue with, uh, for example, fog. So if there is fog you can detect that it will represent itself as a, as a noise in the signal and uh, the sensor fusion method allows you to fuse the data from different sensors so you can fuse for example the signal that you get from a lidar in the optical domain with uh, a signal that you can get uh, from a radar in the electromagnetic domain like a different frequency range and by fusing the two signals together, you can get a good uh, ability to detect, for example, obstacles, even though there is fog. And uh, it may also mean that uh, you get a better signal in terms of a better understanding of uh, your system. So if you have uh, a kind of internal model the sensor fusion may help you to tune the model and uh, to improve uh, the knowledge of the system so we will also see methods that uh, will help us to improve this uh, this model some of the algorithms that i will show you will use an internal model for example in the state space domain and uh, by using these algorithms, we will be able to tune the model so that it uh, represents better the environment. So it will help us to understand better uh, what's happening in the plant. So what is the goal of sensor fusion? As I was saying, it's not a single algorithm. So it is like a very large group of algorithms. Uh, I have chosen only some of them. And uh, the goal is uh, to get a better understanding of our system. And uh, this may mean various things. It, as you saw, it may mean that we get uh, a better model. It may mean that we get uh, better immunity and so on and so on. So if you imagine a general block diagram of uh, any controller system. Here we have our plant. This is our system. That's our machine. That we are trying to control it may be a temperature in a room it may be an autonomous car it may be an airplane whatever you can imagine we get some data from this plant with the help of sensors 
So here are our sensors. We read many variables and we have discussed uh, the at least some selected sensors uh, in the first half of the semester. And the signals from the sensor then go to our controller. And the controller may include the system model. So this is like a mathematical description of uh, how our plant is working. And then we can get this data to a controller. Of course, in uh, let's say standard approaches, uh, the signal from sensors is uh, going directly to the controller. So if this uh, is uh, some kind of P or PI or PID controller, you don't run any system model, but uh, you feed the sensor signals directly to a controller. Then the controller takes the signals from the sensors, eventually uh, also from the model of the system. It will produce some uh, action and uh, this will control the plant. So, for example, if uh, this would be like a very simple temperature control in a room, the plant is uh, the room. We have a heater in the, pla in the plant in the room. We read the temperature with one sensor. We feed it directly to the controller and uh, the controller compares the actual measured temperature with the set point. And if the set point is uh, larger, but if the desired temperature is larger than the actual, it will turn on the heater. If uh, the temperature is smaller, it will turn off the heater. So uh, it, in all cases, it's uh, like a feedback system. So uh, what are the limitations of uh, this approach? Of course, uh, you cannot get good results of the control if you have bad data. So uh, if you have uh, wrong sensors, if uh, you did not select the sensors properly, or if you did not install them properly, uh, you will not uh, get uh, a good result. So uh, even though you may have a perfect model like this, it may be like a quite sophisticated control system. Then with garbage data, you will get garbage results. But it works also other way around. So you may have perfect sensors. You may have perfect signals without any noise, without any interference. But if your model or control system does not work properly, you will get uh, bad results. So this picture illustrates quite well that uh, we need to have uh, good sensors. We need to have a good uh, signal processing methods and also the good uh, control algorithms. And only if uh, all those components are working properly, we will get uh, the good control results. So this is saying that uh, even though you may have uh, very good knowledge about uh, sensors and about uh, control systems, uh, if your machine is not designed properly in terms of mechanics, the control system will not save it. So all the areas are equally important. There is no larger importance in mechanics or in control systems. All those areas work together and only if those fields are working properly, then you can get good results. Uh, let me give you some examples uh, where you can actually find uh, the algorithms for sensor fusion. I have selected a few of them to give you like a preview uh, where it can be applied. So f first of all, uh, the sensor fusion approach is uh, quite used in autonomous systems. So it might be a car, it might be a drone, and uh, in all those areas you need to fuse together multiple signals from different sensors. So here you have a picture of, uh, of a car. Of course it might not be like a fully autonomous car, but uh, you may get uh, some uh, assistance functions, so emergency braking, uh, 
or parking or some communication for example and you can see that we have different sensors we may have a radar in this case they are using it uh, for adaptive cruise control so uh, to get uh, the speed of a car that's going in front of me and uh, to maintain uh, the set speed or maintain the set distance so a radar is um, a sensor that works with electromagnetic waves. Typically, here it works in the, somewhere in the range of um, around 80 gigahertz today. Uh, you may have a lidar, for example. So this may help you to de to detect uh, pedestrians or to avoid collisions or to engage emergency braking. This is an optical system. And here, for example, if uh, it's raining or if you fog, uh, it uh, may limit the resolution and it may limit the ability to, de to detect the obstacles. But if you combine the radar and LiDAR together, you get better info about the environment. And the same is uh, with the camera. Uh, the camera is an optical system, so if it's raining or if um, it's snowing, you may not see anything but you may see some additional info with the radar or with the lidar since they are operating in the in different uh, fields of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum you can see that also those uh, sensors they have typically different ranges so the range of the radar it's uh, typically let's say a few hundred meters can be something from 10 to let's say two or three hundred meters and uh, it is scanning the environment in a narrow beam the lidar typically has a, a lower range but uh, it has a wider beam and uh, the camera has even lower range so let's say 50 meters maybe 100 meters maybe uh, but uh, it is typically quite a, a larger field of view so the control system needs to make some decisions. It needs to decide where to go. Is there an obstacle? Do I need to break? Do I need to avoid the obstacle somehow? And uh, it will fuse those data from different sensors and uh, make a decision based on the fused signals. You can add uh, different sensors. So for example, you can have uh, ultrasonic sensors. On, on the front and on the on the rear of the car that uh, may help you in parking so the the simplest thing is that uh, they will just beep if you see an obstacle behind the car at a certain distance so that you don't uh, don't hit the, the obstacle uh, and it, but it can be also quite advanced and uh, it means that uh, you just give the command and it will park the car for you on on its own and again, for this, it needs more info than just uh, the data from one sensor. So it will fuse uh, the ultrasonic sensor signal with uh, some cameras, uh, with eventually some short range radar and so on. So autonomous systems are quite a good example of uh, sensor fusion algorithms. Uh, you can find them also in uh, flying objects. So uh, if we take a look on the drone, then this is again a typical example where we use the sensor fusion approach. So here you can see a quadroad. Uh, it has multiple sensors. It will have uh, an accelerometer, it will have a gyro, and it, then it may have uh, different sensors as well. So in order to fly it as a pilot, you basically need just two sensors. You need a gyroscope, and already with a gyroscope it can, it can fly, although it's quite difficult to fly just with a gyroscope. But uh, you can add an accelerometer, and you can fuse the signals together, and uh, this will allow you to simplify the flight controller from the pilot's perspective. So you, the, if you fly only on a gyroscope, you need to maintain the yaw and uh, pitch and roll on your, on your own. But if you add an accelerometer, it can fly on its own 
and uh, you just say what should be the different angles that uh, that the, f the, the the drone is flying with. But we can add more sensors and we can improve with this uh, the ability to control our system we can add magnetometer and if we fuse the three signals together uh, it may be possible to fly for example in a defined heading so you want to fly north for example or you want to fly to, towards some defined direction you may add sonar so uh, the sonar together with the barometer can for example get the height above some terrain and uh, you can avoid obstacles or uh, it can for example automatically land the, dr the drone so uh, as soon as it starts approaching ground the sonar will pick the signal and uh, you will be able to, to land it automatically and you may start to add different sensors. You may add a GPS so that the drone knows where it is located in, let's say, absolute coordinate system with respect to, to the Earth coordinates. You may add a LiDAR so that you can avoid some obstacles or that you may map the terrain around you. You can add a camera so that you can fly it as a pilot but uh, with a camera you can also uh, detect, uh, for example, the motion uh, that is very slow and uh, with this help you can stabilize the drone so that it's standing still uh, in the air. And you can add more sensors. You could add, uh, you could add a LiDAR, uh, sorry, radar for example, uh, and many other sensors as well. So uh, even without knowing uh, that this is a sensor fusion approach if you have already if you if someone has uh, built a drone then without knowing it and without calling it that way uh, you have used the sensor fusion approach most probably with the accelerometer and gyroscope with those first two so one of the examples i will show you in this class i believe it will be in the next one or, or the, the, the one after it uh, is uh, how to fuse uh, the sensor signals from accelerometer gyroscope and then magnetometer and different sensors as well uh, on a drone. So we'll make a simulation in MATLAB uh, to see what effect uh, do the sensors have and how we can actually fuse the signal together. And we will also see how to implement this in, uh, in the code. Uh, here is a very similar example. Uh, from quite an interesting paper uh, and uh, what they have done is that uh, they have uh, included uh, a chemical sensor on the drone so uh, they have used some of those sensors to, to fly the drone but uh, they have also used an additional chemical sensor and uh, the chemical sensor can sense um, some specific chemicals and uh, it can follow them. So for example, it can be used to map uh, the distribution of chemicals uh, in, uh, let's say, if there is some, some environmental problem, uh, it will sense the chemical and then it will flow, fly towards it. So it's, uh, you can imagine it like, like a bee that is uh, searching for a plant or, uh, or that is searching for some sugar and uh, that is following the trace uh, where the chemical is, uh, is uh, coming from. So uh, sensor fusion may mean that you can also add uh, not only those sensors, but uh, many others as well, such as chemical sensors in this case. Um, the sensor fusion algorithm is uh, also uh, quite uh, common in, uh, let's say, robotic rovers that are now driving on Mars or any other moon, for example, many other object. Uh, there is a quite interesting book that's called Planetary Rovers. And uh, this actually explains how the robots are built and how they are used uh, in exploring the solar system. So I recommend you to, to take a look at least on the book. It's quite interesting. And uh, here in this picture, you can see 
an example of uh, how such a sensor fusion algorithm works in uh, an autonomous rover. Uh, so, for example, here the IMU, that's an uh, inertial measurement unit. And uh, this is a combination of accelerometer, gyroscope and uh, magnetometer. And uh, from this IMU, you get uh, the attitude signal. So this means you get the orientation in space. You get uh, where is north, uh, which way is down. Uh, what is uh, the pitch and yaw of, uh, of your of your vehicle and uh, then you can use this signal somehow. In this picture you can see that they have combined together this uh, IMU info with uh, the picture of a camera. So uh, you get the pictures of a camera, you may get uh, distances for example from objects, you may get uh, an idea of the obstacle for example and this would be the sensor fusion algorithm. So you fuse the signals together, you get some info about it. Here they have used it to calculate uh, the distance that uh, the rover has, uh, has made. And uh, they have used it also to calculate uh, stereo disparities, which means uh, this is the, the distance between the cameras and between the obstacles that it sees. So basically it gives you like a picture that's showing you how far the obstacles are. And uh, on the very last lecture, so in four weeks from now, I'll be also talking about this stereo disparities, how to process the signals from the cameras and how to get this uh, distance map. You can see that here this is only one example where they have used the sensor fusion. So, for example, here, this is a second one. Here they have used a second camera to get the images, to get uh, the distances from the obstacles. And uh, they then use this, this in another area that might be called uh, sensor fusion. And here they have used to create it, uh, the local elevation map. So, to get uh, the shape of the terrain that is around the rover so that they can plan uh, they can uh, they can plan the path around it so here they can plan uh, where the rover should go and then uh, how it should for example to avoid the the obstacles how to avoid stones how to avoid uh, some deep areas where the rover would fall down so it, in my opinion, this is a quite interesting area because here you need to fuse many sensors and uh, you need to make decisions based on not only a single sensor, but uh, on uh, more sensors that uh, provide you the signals together. So what is it good for? Well, using the sensor fusion approach, uh, we may, for example, improve the signal quality. So uh, we may reduce the noise that we have on our signal. So let's imagine this example. Let's have a sensor 1 and sensor 2. Um, it can be any kind of sensor. Uh, in my demo that you will see today, I will use a temperature sensor. So it can be two independent temperature sensors. So if you take sensor X1, this is my output signal shown in blue here, it will be some signal like this, uh, which has a noise. Um, it will have uh, some mean value, that's uh, the black line here. And uh, when I sample the signal in time, I will sometime I will get a little bit higher temperature, sometime a little bit lower. But in general, it will give me this average. Now, the signal from sensor 2 will be similar because uh, it will have the same mean value, so that's the black line, but uh, it will have a different kind of noise. So I can combine those two signals together and I can reduce the noise. So in this example, I can use the same variable measured with two or more sensors of the same variable and uh, I can reduce the noise of my final signal. So we will see uh, our very first example 
uh, will be doing exactly this approach. Uh, it can also mean or, it, that uh, we will improve the data quality if we use two or more sensors. So imagine that you have a cell phone like this. Probably it's laying around you somewhere. And uh, it will have a sensor that uh, allows it to get the, for example, the orientation of the screen. So if uh, it should be, should be a landscape orientation or a portrait orientation. You can use, of course, a single sensor to do this. Uh, for example, you could use a gyroscope. And uh, by using the gyroscope, you can get uh, the angular velocity and you can get orientation. Or you can use an accelerometer for this. In any case, uh, you will have a signal from the sensor, but this signal will have some noise. So I'm expecting a nice steady value like this if uh, the sensor is in steady state, if it's for example lying on the table. But uh, due to noise coming from various sources like temperature changes, uh, magnetic field changes, uh, vibrations and so on, you will get a noisy signal like this. So uh, by using the sensor fusion methods, you can actually improve the info that you get from the sensor. You will fuse the two signals together. And now we are sensing two different variables. So in my example, I am fusing a gyroscope signal with a magnetometer. So if I want to detect the orientation of a cell phone, I scan the data from the sensor. And uh, if uh, both of them are changing at the same time, it means that uh, probably the, the phone is moving. So if, for example, I get only some info from the gyroscope that something is happening, but not from the magnetometer, then it means that it's most likely noise or vibration, because uh, if you move the phone, both data needs to be moving. You move the phone and uh, you detect the angular velocity from the gyroscope, but at the same time, you need to detect uh, the change of orientation measured with the magnetometer. So this method will assume that uh, those signals are independent, but they are somehow related. And this somehow related in this context with the cell phone means that when I get the signal from the gyroscope that it's moving, I will get also a movement from the magnetometer. And we will see uh, also an example to this uh, on the next lecture. Uh, the third thing that uh, this is good for is uh, to increase the reliability of our system. So, for example, let's say you have an airplane like this. Uh, the airplane will have an autopilot and this is an automated control system. So it will get the data from many sensors. It will get the uh, data from GPS, data from uh, speed sensors, data from uh, power of the engine, and so on and so on. And based on this, it will fly automatically the airplane. And we need a high reliability in this application. So we will use multiple sensors. Here you can see several sensors, three sensors at least, uh, to get uh, the airspeed uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the airplane. And uh, by using th three or more sensors, we can uh, increase the robustness of our system. So we have the three sensors, they measure the same variable, for example, airspeed or angle of attack or whatever. Uh, then we use an algorithm that we will call voting and we will get a sim single signal. Because for the control system, we cannot use three signals for the same variable. If we are controlling the speed, th those will be speed sensors, but we will have a single output, what is the speed. And by using the voting, we can find, okay, the three signals are the same. 
they measure independently the same variable and uh, the output is equal. So it means that they are most likely working properly, all three of them. Now if one sensor fails, it will have quite different value from the two others. So we can decide, okay, now we have the speed, or we have the signal in general, now those two sensors are very close together, so they are most likely working properly. And the third sensor is um, giving me a different value. So I will not use this value, but I will issue a warning. Attention, there is something wrong with your sensors. And uh, eventually uh, you need to take uh, manual control, for example. So by using this kind of sensor fusion algorithms, uh, we can uh, increase reliability if we are using n sensors of the same variable and uh, we are able to detect the error at the end we lose the quality of the signal so uh, we may get uh, higher noise for example but uh, we do not lose the whole signal we would lose the whole signal only if we use if we lose all three of our sensors so one of my examples and the algorithms that I will show you will be also related to this voting, especially for airplane applications. Uh, it may also be good uh, if you are detecting uh, a loss of signal. So let's imagine the following situation. You have a radar and uh, with this radar you are tracking this smaller boat. So you're able to measure what is the distance and uh, what is the heading, for example, and what is the speed of, uh, of, the, of the boat. But it may happen that uh, there will be a larger boat that will block your signal. So uh, without this larger boat, you're detecting this small boat. And then this uh, larger boat comes in and uh, it will block your signal so suddenly you measure this smaller distance you see that this is a larger object and uh, that is moving in a different heading than this smaller boat was previously and uh, with a probably different speed so this means that you lose the signal about uh, what you have been tracking you've been tracking this smaller boat and that's what you are interested but suddenly this larger boat will block it. So you can have uh, a simple mathematical model that will predict what uh, will be the motion of my target, what will be the motion of this small boat. And you know that it will work in short term. So if uh, I have seen the boat at this position, at, with this speed, with this heading, then in the next sample, I cannot see the boat jumping to this position and to have a different headache. So by using the sensor fusion algorithm, you can get uh, a warning about this. Attention, now suddenly the jump, the, 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 the boat seems to jump at this position and it has a different headache. So in short term, you may have a prediction in few seconds, few minutes, for example, that uh, probably the boat was at this position, it was moving in this direction, for example, with this speed. So you can get an estimation where it will be, will be heading. Of course, this works only uh, in short term. Basically, what this is doing is that you have a simple physical model of the boat and uh, you know that a sudden change is not possible. It, can, it cannot suddenly jump from this position to that position and uh, you may be able to detect this. Uh, I think my last example uh, is, uh, well, what is it good for? Is uh, that you can get uh, an estimation of uh, non-measured variables. So imagine a situation like this. Let's say we have a car and uh, we would like to detect uh, the distance of the obstacles that we see in front or behind of the car. So if we use a camera, we see the image, we see the obstacle, 
but uh, with one camera we are not able to get uh, the distance that we have uh, to the obstacles but we can do it with two cameras so here is camera one it gets some picture for example there is another car uh, in front of me and uh, then we have a second camera we know how far the cameras are we know that uh, they are looking at the same image but uh, they will see the image uh, slightly shifted and uh, the shift will be variable with the, the distance of the obstacle so by using the image from two cameras we can uh, basically measure the two angles that we have here phi and theta and uh, we can calculate what is the distance of our obstacle so uh, the non-measured variable here means that uh, with one camera we will not be able to get the distance but uh, we will be able to get the distance by combining the images from two cameras so in this case it is a non-measured variable and non-measured means that we do not measure it so we don't have a sensor for, for that uh, it is but it is not non-measurable and non-measurable would mean that we, it can't be measured so we don't have any sensor for this uh, it's not available we uh, it's basically impossible to get the data so uh, on the very last lecture so in four weeks from now i will be also talking about uh, an algorithm like this and we'll make some uh, matlab uh, coding that will get uh, the disparity map which is basically the distance of uh, of our objects uh, i think uh, i may skip uh, skip this uh, this slide uh, i will just slightly comment on this it's again uh, uh, an autonomous car and uh, we can fuse the signals together to get uh, for example range extension so uh, we have uh, some measured range uh, of the radar radar which is here uh, we have another range for the lidar we have an optical system and uh, by fusing all this info together we may get uh, better info about our environment so what we will be discussing uh, during our series of lectures uh, we will be discussing uh, an algorithm that uh, will decrease uh, the sensor noise. We will be discussing the voting algorithm for multiple sensor. And uh, we will be discussing also the removal of a sudden system lo signal loss if uh, it's not physically possible. Uh, we will be discussing a fusion algorithm uh, of uh, accelerometer, magnetometer and eventually gyroscope uh, in, in different, uh, different versions. Uh, this will be on the drones. And uh, then at the very end we will discuss uh, an algorithm for uh, image processing so that uh, we can use the pictures from the cameras uh, to get the object distance. So in today's lecture, we will be discussing those first two algorithms. So decreasal of noise and uh, voting. Uh, then uh, this removal, sensor fusion, and basically all those, uh, all those points. This will be on the next uh, and on the third lecture from now. And uh, on the very last lecture, so in four weeks from now, we'll discuss this fusion algorithm. So this is uh, the content uh, of algorithms that we will discuss in the following uh, four weeks. Uh, after we finish with the sensor fusion topic, uh, we will discuss sensor validation. And uh, we will again reuse some of those algorithms and uh, we will also learn new ones. Because sensor validation is uh, very common to, uh, very similar to sensor fusion. So uh, in order to validate the signal, you again need to have some internal knowledge about the system. So we'll see more algorithms that are good for this purpose. 
uh, before I uh, start discussion about uh, the algorithms themselves, uh, I will need uh, to make a short side trip to mathematics. Uh, it's probable that uh, you already know how to use uh, the terms such as variance or covariance. But uh, as we will use them a lot, I would like to repeat uh, them here and uh, to explain how they are related to the properties of our signal. So the few following slides uh, will be uh, related to mathematics, how uh, those uh, properties are calculated. So the first term that we will need is uh, called variance. Uh, so imagine like you have a random set of values. This random set might be the data that you are getting uh, from a sensor. And uh, you can calculate what is the mean of your data. So if I would go to my signal that I showed you, for example, in this picture, uh, this is uh, my random data. This is the mean value, the one shown in black. And this is my random signal. And I can calculate uh, the variance and uh, standard deviation. And uh, the variance will tell me how far my signal it's, uh, is from the mean value. So the variance is nothing else than um, a measure how far is uh, the value from the mean value. So if you plot it in a chart, it may look like this. This mu, that is, this is your mean, and uh, if the signal has a Gaussian distribution, then it looks like this. So if you calculate uh, one standard deviation, then it means that uh, in the distance of one standard deviation plus minus sigma here, uh, you have 68% uh, of your samples. So now we are looking for probability. So 68% of our samples will be located in this one standard deviation area. Now if we take an interval with size of plus minus uh, two standard deviations, then 95% of our samples will be in this given area. And uh, if we take uh, three standard deviations, it means that 99.7% of our data will be within this range. So if we calculate the standard deviation or variance, then uh, it will give us an idea what is the size of our interval. So we have a mean value and from this mean value it will be plus or minus let's say three standard deviations. This formula is uh, for the variance. So you can see that here we are summing the actual sample, which is xi. We are subtracting the mean value, which is the, the this is, this is the, here in this chart, they call it mu. Uh, in this equation, they call it ex. This is the same, it's the standard, uh, it's the, the mean. And uh, the variance is telling us how far this is. So it, this is a squared value because uh, in calculating the variance, we don't care if it's like above or below my mean value. So I'm squaring this. So this is the, the variance. If you are looking for standard deviation, then standard deviation is uh, the square root of variance. So you make a square root of this and uh, you get the standard deviation. Uh, so it's standard deviation, it's, uh, you see here this formula, it's the same like we've just seen, uh, except here we have the square root, and this will give us the standard deviation. Now in some of my examples, uh, I will work with uh, the standard deviation, in some of them I will work uh, with the variance. It will depend uh, based on the algorithms that we will be using. Uh, anyway, this assumption that uh, it's within 99.7 or 95 and so on, uh, well, this assumption is uh, valid only if you have a Gaussian distribution. So, 
Again, I will assume that uh, all my signals will have a Gaussian distribution so that we can use those equations. Uh, the next term that we will need to know about is called covariance. And uh, the covariance is uh, a measure of uh, a mutual correlation of two signals. So if we have signals that have nothing in common, that they are independent, then uh, we will have so-called uncorrelated signal and those signals will have a covariance of zero. Now, if our signals are correlated, then uh, we can calculate the covariance, if it's two signals, or if uh, we have more than two signals, we will create something that's called a covariance matrix. So, as an example here, I have a covariance matrix of uh, three signals. Now, what is the covariance if we calculate the signal compared to the same signal? Well, it will be equal to the variance. So, um, it will be equal to sigma squared. That's, uh, that's this equation. So, if uh, we are looking on, on how, let's say, dependent is uh, the same signal on its own, then it will be equal to its variance. So in a covariance matrix, uh, we have uh, this, let's say this uh, overview of uh, the variance and covariance of our signals. So on the diagonal here, we have uh, the variances of our signal. So I have signal 1, signal 2 and signal 3. So on the, here on the diagonal, I have sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared and sigma 3 squared. And now in uh, the rows and columns, I have uh, the covariance of my different signals. So for example, this covariance uh, would tell me what is the dependence of signal one on signal two, if there is any dependence. If there, the signals will be uncorrelated, this covariance would be zero. And in the same way here, this would tell me what is the dependence of signal 2 on signal 1. Now, I will assume that uh, the signals, if they are dependent, that they have the same dependency. So that 1 is dependent on 2 in the same way like 2 is dependent on 1. And this is what we will be calling a symmetrical matrix. So, in this case, the covariance of 2 versus 1 will be equal to the covariance of 1 versus 2. But in general, it does not have to be like this. So, uh, there might be a difference if you're talking from signal 1 to 2 or from 2 to 1. And here we can see the same for signals 1, 3 and 3 to 1. So again, I will assume that this is a symmetrical matrix. And here, this covariance matrix will uh, tell us what is basically the dependence of the signals on the different signals. So in many cases, I will assume that there is no dependence like this, so that uh, we have um, basically an independent signal. But uh, I will show you also some calculation examples uh, how it will change our calculation if we consider and if we have this uh, mutual dependence, this mutual covariance. So let's take a look now uh, on our very first example. And uh, we will learn how to reduce the noise of a sensor. So let's say we have uh, two sensors and those two sensors measure independently the same variable. So for example, this will be a temperature sensor. I will measure the temperature in a room and uh, I would like to decrease the noise. So I take a second sensor. It will get the same variable. It will measure the temperature as well. 
but I will assume that the now it's independent measurements and that my noise is independent. So my very first calculation will assume that we have uncorrelated sensor noise. So if you plot this uh, in a time plot, it, you will see something like this. This is the, the, the black line. This is uh, the mean value of uh, my temperature. I am assuming that uh, they both give me the same reading in terms of mean value, but they will both give me different signal because they will have different noise. So sensor one shown in blue here uh, will give me a signal like this. For, at some instance, it will be larger than the average. At some instance, it will be smaller than the average. And uh, sensor two shown in green will give me the same mean value, but different noise. Here I have some signal above, some signal below and so on. And what we would like to do is uh, we want now to fuse this signal together and uh, we want to obtain one temperature reading, but uh, this should give me lower noise than an individual signal. So at the end, uh, if we are uh, evaluating the variance of my signal, it means that uh, we will get lower variance on our final signal than on each individual signal just on its own. So let's define uh, some uh, symbols that uh, I will use uh, in uh, the equations. So I, I will use Fi as um, a symbol for the sample of my few signal. So all the algorithms that you will see in this class, they will be sample based. So I will sample some signal, I will do something with those samples, and I will output a sample that has uh, been processed somehow. Now X1i and X2i will be the sample of my raw signal that I get from the sensor. So X1 is my signal from sensor 1 and uh, X2 is the sensor from is the signal from sensor 2. Uh, X1 and X2 will have some signal variance X1 squared and X2 squared. Now let's take a look what this variance basically means. Well it means that uh, we get uh, an idea about the width of our inter interval. So we have some mean value of my signal and this variance is uh, telling me how wide this interval is. So if uh, I have a small variance of my signal, it means that uh, it's uh, changing um, only a little compared to the mean value. In other words, the interval is small if uh, the variance of my signal is large, then uh, I have the mean value and the interval is large around it. So you can interpret variance also as uh, the confidence in your signal. So if you have a small variance, you mean that uh, the samples are close to each other. So uh, you have a fairly good signal and uh, you will place high confidence in this signal. If on the other hand you have a large, a large variance, it means that uh, the samples are spread largely around your mean and uh, you will not have high confidence in such signal. And this is exactly the approach that we will be using. The algorithm that I will show you is called Confidence Weighted Averaging. So we will create an average and this average will be our output signal. That will be our fuse signal. But uh, it will not be a simple average. But we will weight the signals based on their variance. So if uh, our variance of my signal, for example, X1 uh, is small, I will place a high confidence in my signal. So I will take a larger portion of my sample in the, in the averaging. 
and uh, if on the other hand Sigma 2 would be quite large I will place low confidence on this on this signal and I will take only a small portion of it so uh, we will use a formula like this now it may seem complicated but uh, it is actually very simple it is nothing else than a weighted average so I take the signal x1 that I get at instant i I multiply it with the variance of my signal and now this is uh, this is the inverse uh, value of the variance so it's 1 over sigma 1 squared and what this will do is that uh, if sigma 1 if the, the variance is uh, large then 1 over large number will be small number so I will multiply with a small number the value of x1 and I do the same for x2 so if uh, x2 if the variance of my signal is small I will place a high confidence in this signal and it means that uh, 1 over a small number will be a large number and I will multiply my signal x2 with a large number so by this I will place uh, high confidence on signal x2 and low confidence on signal x1 and in order to maintain the scale of my output signal you are dividing that with the sum of uh, inverse values of sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared so this is a standard formula for a weighted average and the weight is uh, the inverse value of uh, your signal uh, so I will show you uh, one example uh, in MATLAB uh, how, uh, how this actually works so uh, before I switch to MATLAB let me explain uh, the signals that uh, we will see uh, here I have uh, a random signal I have chosen that uh, this uh, random signal is uh, temperature and that's uh, that it's giving me 23.5 second like arbitrary value that's the mean value and uh, I will have two sensors that will be reading the temperature x1 and x2 and we can see that uh, I read the temperature uh, sample by sample which is on the on the x-axis I get different values so it's all around the mean value the, the blue signal is the x1 and the, the red signal is uh, x2 and we get different different values now uh, what we will be doing is that um, I will be using uh, a picture I will be using uh, a board like this uh, now this is an Arduino board and uh, I'm sending the data through USB to, to MATLAB well actually in, right now uh, I have uh, pre-recorded the, the videos because currently I don't have this board available it's somewhere in school and uh, I can't get there so the videos that you will be seeing the live demos uh, are pre-recorded and uh, on this board I have uh, several sensors for different variables so today I will be using those two sensors those two sensors are temperature sensors uh, if you are interested in the specific type you can see it here it's a uh, it's a, a sensor equipped with a, with a one wire bus and uh, it uh, communicates through one wire which is this yellow one uh, to, to the Arduino so what co what my code is doing it's uh, reading the data sample by sample with some specified sampling frequency and uh, I will plot the results in MATLAB uh, I will be using this board also for future demos so uh, I have installed more sensors uh, there is an accelerometer which is this one uh, there is a gyroscope which uh, is also this one and uh, then there is a barometric sensor that's the last one here and uh, this one is a magnetometer 
so we'll be able to see this uh, in action on, on the video and uh, I will use it uh, not only today but also next week and in two weeks uh, to show you the, the demos with the, the Kalman filtering and with the other algorithms uh, that uh, we will be using. So now uh, let me switch to MATLAB and uh, you can, uh, I will first com uh, comment the code and uh, then we'll run it and we'll see what it's what this is actually doing. Uh, I have uploaded uh, those uh, examples uh, also in Moodle. So uh, if you if you look here in Moodle, this uh, demo software for sensor fusion, uh, you will also you will be able to download this code. Some of them uh, are just MATLAB simulations, so we can run them uh, without any hardware and uh, some of them require the Arduino but they can be modified uh, also so that they work uh, as just uh, pure simulations uh, in, uh, in MATLAB. So my first example is uh, running only in MATLAB and uh, I will use the algorithm, the fusion algorithm uh, to see what is uh, my uh, improvement of noise in my signal. Uh, so let's take a look now on this code and uh, let's see how this actually works. So first of all, I will generate uh, the constant signal. So I have chosen that my signal has uh, the constant mean value of uh, 23.5 and uh, that uh, it will have 1000 samples. Now some of my examples will work on um, predefined number of samples uh, some of them will work sample by sample so if uh, you want, would like to implement uh, those algorithms in real hardware uh, you would probably need to uh, modify them to a sample by sample basis so this gives me a constant value I have two signals they have the same mean value of 23.5 now those two lines they add a Gaussian white noise to my signal. Now white noise means that um, all the frequencies have an equal distribution. So I'm adding some frequencies, some noise, but the probability that a certain frequency in my given range will be added is the same. And I have chosen a Gaussian white noise with those parameters. So uh, you can modify that, but uh, it doesn't doesn't that it's not very important for this demo. Uh, then what I do uh, here is uh, I sum the noise uh, with my original signal. So in x1 and x2, I will have uh, the uh, the noise signal. Uh, now if you would work with, uh, with the real hardware uh, your algorithm would basically start uh, start somewhere here because you don't need to produce your signal uh, in this way in, Ma in MATLAB you would get the real signal from uh, from your hardware then I plot the signals so that we see on screen how they look like and uh, then I calculate the variance of, of my signal now one of the reasons why I have chosen in this demo to have uh, a full signal like a, for, for a, I've chosen 1000 samples for no reason at all but f at least few samples are required and one of the reasons I've done so is that uh, here I can calculate the variance of the whole set. If uh, you would like to run this sample by sample then the algorithm will need to be modified. And uh, a little bit later today, I will also show you how this should be done. So this calculates me the variance. And uh, let's just, uh, let's just uh, run the code and see uh, what's going on. Uh, here we can see the, the variance in my, of my signals. Uh, you can see it's something like 0. 0.2 and this is about the same now the 
the reason why the variance of my signal is the same is exactly in my choice of, uh, of my signal, of my noise here. So I have chosen that my variance of both signals is the same. I have chosen that it's 0 0.02. This was like an arbitrary choice. I just was playing with the numbers. Again, with the real signal, you would get uh, a variance of your real signal. And what this means is that in my example, I have chosen that uh, the variance of my signal is the same. So in my few signal, I will place uh, the same confidence in signal 1 and in signal 2, simply because they have the same var variance. If, for example, I would ch choose it differently so that, let's say, signal 2 has a larger variance, then the final result would uh, place lower confidence in my signal 2. So it will have a lower weight. And uh, this is the actual weighted average of my signal. And this is the formula that uh, you've seen on my slide. So I calculate the fuse signal. Now here I'm doing it sample by sample, just to see how the algorithm would run. Now I take the sample of signal 1, I multiply it with the inverse value of uh, its variance. So this gives me the weight. I do the same for signal 2. And then in order to maintain the, the scaling and the same units, I divide it by the sum of uh, the inverse values of the variances. So this is uh, the formula that uh, we have seen here. Here, exactly, I'm doing the same stuff in MATLAB. Uh, in MATLAB, I'm doing this sample by sample. Uh, you could speed it up if you run it as on a block, like uh, in, in MATLAB. But uh, if you would Im implement this uh, on your own in, in any language, on any microcontroller, for example, uh, you would need to run it sample by sample, and uh, this is my this is my result. I will first show you the numerical result. So, uh, the original variance of uh, my signal was zero point zero two, and uh, the se second signal was the same variance, and we can mathematically prove that uh, the variance of my fused signal will be one half of the original variance. So in this case, since my original variance for both signals was 0.02, now my variance of few signals is 0.01. And uh, let's take a look on uh, the data that uh, we have been plotting. So this is my temperature signal. The, the one shown in blue and uh, the one shown in red, those are my input signals, x1 and x2. And uh, the fuse signal is uh, actually the one shown in, uh, let's say, orange here. Uh, from this time plot, uh, we can't see much. We can see that it's moving somewhere around the average, but we cannot see what is the variance of our signal. So what I will do is that I will plot uh, the histogram of my data. And uh, in the histogram, we can see what is the count in different groups of, uh, of, of values and uh, how often they occur. So we can see that here, this is a fairly nice uh, Gaussian distribution. Uh, and the same for signal 2. Now the reason why it's not like a perfect Gaussian distribution is that uh, in our example we have uh, a limited number of samples. I have chosen only 1000 samples, which is uh, a fairly low value. If I would increase the number of samples, this would get better and better near the Gaussian function uh, with increasing numbers of, uh, of counts of my samples. Uh, anyway, here we can see that uh, this is the variance of uh, signal x1. This is the variance of uh, signal x2. And that they have approximately the same variance. 
Again, the fact that they don't have exactly the same variants lies uh, in the lower, uh, relatively lower number of samples that I am using in my calculation. Uh, but we can see that uh, after we fuse the signal, we get a histogram like this. And it has, uh, at the first side, it has a smaller variance. So by combining those two signals together, we were actually able to reduce the variance of our fuse signal by, by one half. So it can be mathematically proven that uh, if uh, we use uh, the signal of uh, some variance, then the variance of our fuse signal will decrease by one half, or well, this is assuming the variance is the same of both signals, and that the standard deviation will, de will decrease by one over square root of two. Now, in general, for n signals with the same variance, uh, the variance will decrease by one over n, and standard deviation will decrease by one over square root of n. Uh, so this was uh, this was the demo. Uh, here is an explanation why does it decrease uh, by uh, the square root uh, of two if we are talking about standard deviation, and uh, by by half if we're talking about uh, variance. So let's imagine we have uh, we have basically what we're doing is a formula like this. We are multiplying the weight, which is the inverse value of uh, the variance, with my value of signal. Uh, so for two signals uh, with the same variance, we have a formula like this. So we take signal 1, multiply it by inverse uh, value of variance, and we, we sum it with the, X, the same for signal 2. So now let's assume that uh, we have the same variance so that sigma 1 is uh, equal to sigma 2. So what we can do is that we use a formula like this. Um, I have replaced that uh, sigma here. This sigma is uh, sigma 1 equals to sigma 2. Uh, of course, if you add this, you will see that uh, here, uh, there, uh, now my, now my uh, annotations here are a little bit off, so now let me just uh, correct them, so not my pointer, but uh, pen. So what will happen basically in this formula is that uh, this will eliminate, well, uh, not, uh, not this, uh, um, basically this will, this will cancel like that. And uh, what we will get is sigma squared divided by 2. So if uh, my original variance of signal was sigma, then the variance of my fuse signal is this sigma divided by two. And you can generalize this uh, also for, for more than two signals. Uh, basically, you can see this is a same formula like, uh, for example, if you're using uh, two resistors in parallel. Uh, so uh, let's take a look now uh, on uh, how we can actually uh, reduce the noise by using uh, this algorithm live. Um, as I was saying, I don't have the board right now with me, so I cannot do this demo live, but uh, I have it pre-recorded uh, and uh, I will comment, uh, comment the video that we will be seeing. So, uh, what uh, is this uh, this uh, this uh, demo? You have it also on uh, in in Moodle. Uh, this demo will read uh, in in real time the data from uh, the Arduino board. The data is temperature, as we will see here. Now the red points are sensor one, and the black points will be sensor two. So what I will, am doing right now is that I'm reading the samples. Uh, one by one, and I have chosen the sampling period of uh, about one second. So I'll get the data like this. I think uh, I have chosen uh, 50 samples, and uh, after I get uh, this 50 samples, I will apply the algorithm that I just described on the real data. So I will calculate the variance of uh, signal one 
the variance of signal 2 and based on their variance I will calculate the weighted uh, average of my signal and that's what we uh, will see right now let me just uh, maybe fast forward a little bit okay so uh, first of all I am calculating uh, the histogram or plotting the histogram we'll see that uh, it will have uh, the um, roughly the same uh, mean value and uh, roughly the same uh, the same variance and uh, after I do this uh, I will uh, run the fusion algorithm and uh, in the fusion algorithm uh, I am taking all my 50 samples and uh, I will plot this in a chart and uh, I will uh, apply the fusion algorithm so what I'm doing right now in the video is that I'm running it again but now uh, with a larger number of samples just uh, so that we have uh, different uh, different values uh, and more values and we can see what is the effect uh, of a uh, higher number of samples now obviously if you have a larger number of samples uh, you need uh, to wait more before you get uh, the final signal but uh, on the other hand if you have more samples this will give you uh, a better better histogram in terms of uh, finer uh, finer groups uh, that you have and it will be more closer to the Gaussian distribution so uh, let me you can just uh, fast forward that this is the sample signal that I got uh, from my simulations uh, we can see uh, the, again the histograms so now they have more groups and uh, at the end uh, I will apply the fusion algorithm so uh, we will see a new signal that uh, will be uh, plotted in uh, in uh, the chart and uh, we will see that it will have a lower uh, lower variance than the, the two original signals so let's see if I am able to actually fast forward it again yes that's that's the one here so uh, now just uh, rearrange the, the charts so here uh, we can see our few signal that's uh, the one shown here in magenta we can see that uh, on the very first side it has uh, smaller variants that are original signals so that is much closer together to our original signal to our mean value and uh, here in this uh, histogram you can also see that it has a smaller variance now please note that uh, in my chart here the signal since this was a real data from real sensors uh, they did not have exactly the same mean value so for example the first signal here had uh, something like 23.995 maybe the, the mean value but uh, this uh, second signal had something like 23.8 so there was a slight difference between the mean values of my signals but even in this case when the signal is not the same uh, we see that uh, we had uh, reduced the variance of our signal so you can take a look on this uh, you can run uh, the algorithm yourself and you can see that this will really give me uh, a smaller uh, smaller variance in the result now uh, you can uh, do this uh, calculation also in real time and this requires you to sample and calculate uh, the mean value and variance uh, sample by sample so by variance it's quite easy you just uh, calculate it by this formula you see that this is uh, x uh, i minus one is the sample from the is the average from the previous sample so this is uh, calculated in runtime uh, for variance it's a little bit more difficult uh, but uh, you can 
find um, some, some formula how to do this actually again here this this should be this should be over there so uh, for variance it's a little bit more complicated but uh, it's still doable in real time so if you run this in real time you would for every sample you would calculate the mean you would calculate the variance and uh, you would uh, calculate the few signal based on the equations and uh, that's uh, that's basically uh, what I'm doing in my next uh, example uh, we will discuss this next example on uh, our on the beginning of uh, our next lecture so next week